Hello and welcome to another episode of My Favourite Game from the Honest Football Podcast. This week we're delighted to be joined by Alex Dono, who works over on the Five Reasons Sports Network in the US. He's also available on other radio and as a voiceover as well. But more importantly, he's an American with Italian heritage. He's grown up following Italy and has become a massive Inter Milan fan. And we talk about that a lot in today's episode, as well as his memories of football growing up, the state of the game over in his home in the US, and the prospect of David Beckham's Miami side coming to his local city. We also, of course, ask about his favourite game, so I hope you enjoy the episode and thanks for giving it a listen. And don't forget, if you'd like to be part of this favourite game series, just give us a message at Honest Football 3. Okay, so I'm delighted to be joined by Alex now and I'll start as I do with most guests with our first question, which is what's your first football in memory? It can be either as playing or as a fan watching on TV or even live at a stadium. But what's your first football in memory in your life? So this is an interesting one because I didn't really come to appreciate football until I started playing football. <laughs> the, the first sport that I started playing when I was five and six years old was baseball. My parents put me in it and I hated it. I, I just... I didn't really have uh, have much of a much of a sport love until eight, I was around eight years old when okay. uh, you know because growing up with my my father who was uh, you know born and raised in Italy uh, he had kind of tried to push me into football when I was a little kid and I <laughs> I resisted up until I was eight years old uh, I started to play with my friends because my friends were getting into it and that's what really gave me a love for it was when I started to play I, I developed a passion for it and. You know, my father was a big supporter of, of Inter and the Italian national team. So once I started playing for myself, that's when I also started to appreciate watching it. OK, that's great. Because that's probably the opposite way around to most of our guests. I guess in Europe, normally the first thing we remember is watching it on TV. I, I just wonder over in the US, is the TV access to football or at that time, was it as strong as it is over here in Europe, I guess? Or does it more focus on baseball and basketball and the likes? Yeah, at that time, this is uh, this is in the the early '90s when I started to appreciate it, and the TV access was not good at that point in, okay. in the United States. I mean, the any time there was an international tournament, if it was a World Cup, the access was great. You know, my father did subscribe to I think the one Italian channel you get in the United States, <laughs> so he he was able to watch some Serie A matches uh, on the weekends. But but overall, it was you kind of waited until the next World Cup came around before you could watch too much. It got yeah. a lot better through the years. And then I guess moving on from that is as you were growing up watching football, what's your first memory of watching? Is it a World Cup or an international tournament, or is there a particular game watching that stands out to you? Really, when when I, I really fell in love with watching the game was the 1994 World Cup, which was okay. played in the USA. So everyone in the USA got really excited for that. <laughs> and, you know, li living in Miami, unfortunately, none of the matches were played here. Uh, so my, my father and I would watch the Azzurri play. We would support Italy, who got all the way to the final that year. Yeah. And, you know. And and one of my most vivid memories, and I was nine years old at the time, was when when Italy and Brazil, you know, were playing in the World Cup final. It was a very tense game. You know, no yeah. one no one scored in regulation. <laughs> no one scored in, in extra time. They went to penalty kicks. And uh, I can remember at one point my my father just decided, I, I think you're bad luck. So he had me go watch from a different room while he watched <laughs> it from the living room. And at a certain point, I don't think I was even allowed to watch the end of the game at all. And I, you know, that that, that sort of is what taught me my own superstitions, which I, I've carried with me, you know, almost 30 years later. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I can remember how tense that was. And, you know, we all know how that ended Baggio missed the missed the penalty kick yeah. Brazil ended up hoisting the cup that year but you know seeing seeing the Azzurri run to the final I, I was you know nine years old at the time and and that really that really helped me solidify my love for the game that's brilliant and I guess you couldn't pick a much bigger <laughs> game could you <laughs> certainly not and then I guess moving forward domestically, obviously we're, we'll probably get to you following into Milan. I guess you've mentioned you to your father already, but what were your first memories of domestic football? Yeah, really, it was um, even before that World Cup. 
uh, my, my father started to turn me on to Inter Milan. And the TV access wasn't great at the time. I think it was, uh, uh, they had one Rye channel that you could subscribe to in the USA. And they, they tended to show maybe one game a week on Sundays, but a lot of highlights. And so, you know, I, I can remember watching, you know, a team and, and throughout the 90s, you know, it wasn't Inter's best period. They won a couple of UEFA Cups, but had some, disappointing runs in in city uh but i, I can remember some of uh, the players that I, I really started to admire ruben sosa up front nicola berti in the midfield yeah. <laughs> ricardo ferry at the back and then you know after the world cup 94 you know inter ended up you know bringing gianluca paliuca on as keeper and he was one of my favorite players in the 90s and then you know obviously when, when it came to building the squad things really exploded yeah. in the late 90s when Ronaldo came in and so I uh it, it was something to me I, I sort of uh I, I really became a, a bigger Azzurri supporter first but then you know once I really and, and throughout the 90s the access to the club game became a little bit better through television and so you know my uh my my fire and love for Inter really started to grow throughout that time that's great and then I guess moving into the the, this century, I guess, and the last 20 years with Inter Milan. What have been some of your standout moments following them, would you say? Well, really, uh, the height for me, I think the height for any Inter supporter was, you know, the period after Calciopoli, which was, you know, a, a major em- embarrassment, of course, to the Italian game that saw yeah. Juventus re- relegated, saw them, you know, have to forfeit one of two of their titles, one of which was was sent over to Inter. But you know, watching the sides start to win, finally starting to win Scudetti, um, you know, throughout the, uh, you know, 2006 through 2009. And then Mourinho came on in, in 2009. And then, you know, the, the pinnacle for me, it, it, it really felt like uh, it felt like a, a culmination of, you know, 20 years supporting that club when yeah. they were finally able to, to win the Champions League. And, you know, it was it, it was it was bittersweet because. You know, that also ended Mourinho's cycle with Inter. Yeah. And yeah, I, I can still remember the scenes of uh, Marco Materazzi and Jose Mourinho embracing and, and tears were shed. And One of the most famous know. images, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. It certainly is. And and boy, who, who would have thought uh, at that moment, being, being at, at the highest of the high as a supporter of that club, seeing them you know, win not only the Champions League, but win the treble that season to win Coppa Italia, to yeah. win Serie A as well, to think that uh, the, the rough, bumpy road that would be ahead with some really subpar finishes uh, throughout the last 10 years. So if, <laughs> I, I think I think if I had known how long it would be before they would start to build again towards that sort of success, I probably would have cherished that moment in 2010 even more than I did at the time. <laughs> I think I would have appreciated it a lot more. And then I guess moving forward to now, obviously this season Inter have had a bit of a resurgence, probably been building over the last sort of year or two, but obviously Antonio Conte joined this year and as we speak, they're up there at the top of the league. Have you started to dream yet or do you think it's a little bit too soon? I think it's a little bit too soon and let me table that by saying that it's going to depend a little bit on what they can do to build the squad in the January transfer window, because I think they need at least one reinforcement in the midfield. Uh, I think they need at least one reinforcement at wing back. And then the big thing for me is if they are truly going to contend with Juventus through May, they're going to need a little bit of luck. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's been, it's been a little bit of Murphy's law up until this point. When you think about, you know, Stefano Sensi, who was their shining star at midfield for the first two months he hasn't played at least not consistently since October he tried to make one comeback game and then suffered a setback with injury yeah. uh, Nicolo Barella who's been another standout at the midfield he he suffered an injury he should be returning at some point after Christmas and and beyond that the midfield has been left very thin very decimated and it's really affected the way Antonio Conte can manage these games and so I just I, I look at what Juventus brings to the table and they essentially have have two squads like they've got an A team and a B team and yeah. even their B team could probably contend for a Scudetto. They're they're that <laughs> talented. And so it, it really, to me, uh, for for Inter to to be truly a contender level on points with a chance to win the Scudetto, you know, uh, up until May, I think it's really going to have to be the perfect storm of incredible management, squad management by Conte and 
a lot of luck with injury. You know, I look at a team that I think has been fortunate to this point with their health has been Lazio. And you know, yeah. I know that you, you had a recent episode with my good friend Jerry Mancini, who is like over the moon with how well <laughs> Lazio has been playing. And and it's, it's not to disrespect their squad at all because they've been on just an incredible run of form in the league. Uh, but they've been very lucky, very fortunate when it comes to the health of their squad. And, and for Inter, it's been the absolute opposite. So yeah. I, I certainly have dreams in the back of my mind of, of a potential Scudetto race because it's been so long. You know, not only since Inter has been in the conversation, but outside of two years ago with Napoli, Juventus has virtually not been challenged during their dominant run Absolutely. of the last eight years. So uh, I, I would love to see a true Scudetto race down uh, until May. But I... I, I kind of have to see it to believe it, if that makes any sense. No, that's perfect. I guess that I've spoken to a couple of Inter fans in the last week for this podcast, and they've all said the same thing, which is they're not allowing themselves to dream yet. So I guess that probably <laughs> helps the club as well, doesn't it? So, <laughs> Yeah, it certainly does. I, I think it, it almost, um, I think we're going to reach a point within the next, probably within the next two, three years. And, and I, I, I don't know exactly how long Conte cycle with Inter is going to be my logic would tell me it's probably going to be around three years uh, total before he you know looks to move on to the next thing so I I think at some point within the next two seasons it's going to reach a point with Interisti where we're thinking okay this has to be the year that we we need to win Scudetto we need to really make a deep run in Champions League right I, I think within the first year I almost look at it like uh, Conte is sort of on scholarship that the, yeah. the expectations are not too high the first season but <laughs> I think it's going to reach a point very soon where uh, a lot of uh, a lot of Inter supporters will be very upset if they're not lifting silverware I agree and I think he's partly caused that with his start this year so he's probably not helped himself in that regard <laughs> yeah very true very true uh, and then I guess moving over one of the things that fascinates me obviously with you being from the U.S. is that there's a there's a bit of a perception of the MLS over here and I'm not sure how invested you are in the MLS, but I'm interested to know the picture of it over in the US because over here it's painted as the sort of retirement league for European <laughs> footballers. But I'm interested to know how it's how it's talked about over there, how it's regarded, I guess. Yeah, that's such a great question. And I think that I, I really think that the way the MLS is viewed is very regional to different parts of the United States. And, and what I mean by that is... Uh, I, I live in, in Miami, and there are a ton of people from all around the world who live here. Uh, ma- many of, many of uh, the football supporters I know are South American. I know some Europeans. And so uh, a, a lot of my close friends who love the game primarily support European clubs, and the MLS is an afterthought. And I, I think that's true of this area. I think maybe if you're in the Midwestern parts of the United States and the Pacific Northwest where, you know, the Seattle Sounders and the Portland Timbers have tons of support. I I think people kind of look at MLS as a much bigger deal. Uh, You know, I I think a lot of people in many circles do view the MLS kind of the way you said it as a retirement league. And it's sort of it's sort of a combination of a retirement league and a developmental league. Right. You're either. You know, most of the standout players are either 20 or or 35, right? There's not (laughs) there's not a whole lot of quality in between. And I I think uh, I'm glad you asked this question because it's going to be a very interesting case study uh, in my part of the states within the next couple of years, because, you know, David Beckham's uh, inter Miami is (laughs) uh, about about to debut coming up in 2020. And uh, full disclosure, I I don't watch a whole lot of MLS, but now that I'm going to have a local club, uh, I'm. I'm really going to dive and invest more into the league and I plan to support this club. And so uh, I, I just wonder, cause I, you know, I watch probably eight, nine MLS matches a year, but not more than that. If I start watching every single match day, uh, what my impressions of the league will be, let's say a year from now, I wonder how that's going to evolve and change. Yeah. I'm quite interested in that. Obviously it was going to be my only other question about the MLS with David Beckham taking a side to Miami and I guess, are there, are there any names you're hoping to see over there? Because there have been quite a few talks about in the UK, and it's a massive story because it's David Beckham and he's basically royalty over here. But I'm interested to know if there are any players that you would really like to see in the MLS, particularly at Miami. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of the bigger names that have been rumored are pipe dreams at the moment. Like we've seen Edinson Cavani's name linked. Yeah. And, you know, of course, I, I always laugh when I see some headlines about, oh, within the next couple of years, Messi wants to come to Miami. It's like <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of that is is the press trying to captivate people's imaginations. Um I, I think for at least the first couple of years, it's not to say they're not going to reach for the stars and bring in someone with international recognition. But I, I think for the first season or two, they're probably going to focus more on on younger players and even players with uh, MLS experience. I see I see what they've been doing so far in building the squad. I think they have 14 or 15 players now assembled on the squad. They seem to be going more for kind of a young uh, Argentinian type of core. They're really looking at, at the Bocas and the Rivers to find some players uh, yeah. to bring over. So, you know, it, it may be the right approach. Um, but, you know, w- when you start talking about bringing in bigger names who have played in Europe, I think that could be a big value in creating more star power and more excitement of people come coming to the stadium to watch games. Because, Absolutely. you know, cause you, you guys may not may not uh, know this so much uh, being being in the U.K., but, one of uh, one of the interesting reputations that you know the the South Florida Miami area has is don't have a whole lot of hardcore support for the sports teams unless you either win consistently or you bring in some big names. Like this is not <laughs> this is not a town like let's say Pittsburgh or Boston where fans will show up to the stadium whether the team is in first place or last place. Right? Yeah. I, I think South Florida is a little bit more fickle with their support. So if you're not either <laughs> winning every game or, you know, bringing, you know, a Zlatan type superstar to the yeah. park every weekend, you may be struggling to, to fill up uh, the stadium with fans. So I wonder how they're going to address that. If they think maybe, maybe they think David Beckham just being at the games will be enough to get people to want to go. Yeah, I'm quite interested in that. And I think obviously Miami will probably become one of the, the biggest stars of the MLS league in the UK purely because of David Beckham being part of the ownership. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. And, and, and let me say this about what he what he's done with, you know, his uh, his partners and, and some of the people that are working with him on this club. They have done a really good job, I think, reaching out to the community. They've held a lot of events and parties. They had a big watch party for the MLS expansion draft a few weeks ago. And and I, I think they when it comes to marketing and promotion, I think they're doing a, a good job developing the fan base. I there are at least two or three official supporters groups that have already sprung up. And a lot of my friends are, are kind of a part of that. So I think when it comes to building the grassroots fan base, I think they're doing everything right so far. That's good to hear. And obviously for your sake, I hope they're a success. So you have a good local team to go and watch. Absolutely. We've been missing that for a long time. We, we, <laughs> we had a club, we had a club about 20 years ago called the uh, Miami fusion uh, in the yeah. MLS who, who did pretty well, but, there were some mismanagement problems, so they ended up folding. And it was unfortunate because it was fun to be able to go out to the park and watch games. But yeah. you know, it's been almost two decades now since we've had it. So it'll be nice to have back. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then obviously on to the big question, which is the the whole point of this podcast, which is our favorite game series. We always ask people what's their, their favorite ever football match. And it can be for a number of reasons. It can be either just the game itself being a particularly entertaining one somewhere you traveled to go to a game and it was really enjoyable or even just the experience of the day itself. So I'd like to ask you, what's your favorite football game and why? This was such a great question. And I, I had to think about this long and hard because <laughs> I, I could have gone, I could have gone for a certain champions league final, but the more that I thought about it, I just remember the experience and the joy that I had watching the 2006 World Cup final between Italy and France. And this was not a game that I attended. This was not a game that I covered as media. But why it was so enjoyable was uh, I I have a lot of of friends back home that, you know, are Italian football supporters, but not I don't have a whole lot of personal friends who are in Teristi. So I have friends who support Milan. I even believe it or not, have a friend who supports Juventus. I have friends who support Roma. And I can remember, you know, and I'm, I'm I think I was 2021 20, at the time of the of the 2006 final coming together a big watch party of Italian football supporters. And no matter whether you wore the the black and white or the red and black or the blue and black, I think we, we all came together to to support the Azzurri and just the the highs and lows of that 2006 final seeing you know, early on, uh, Zidane getting the penalty and, 
you know, when he hit that PK, it was a, a Panenka that he actually put off the crossbar, but it bounced right behind the line. Yeah. We're all thinking he, he didn't make that. He didn't make it. It's not a goal. We're, we're celebrating. And then a few seconds later, you see, no, it did bounce behind the line. And, <laughs> And and one of my favorite you know stories of that cup was you know the, the, I think the one Inter player who was on the squad Marco Materazzi who yeah. you know I, he was very heavily involved in that match as you remember he he's the one who 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 got that uh, he's the one who committed the foul to pick up that pen he's the one who scored you know Italy's goal in in regulation hitting uh, the header off the Pirlo corner kick yeah. And he's not then, remembered course, for any of that. <laughs> yeah, he's not remembered for any of that because uh, he is remembered for taking the infamous Zidane headbutt that got Zinedine <laughs> sent off uh, in, in the extra time. And boy, the, the legends that emerged from that and the confusion that was created in those moments because yeah. you know, the, the, the head referee didn't, didn't see it. Like he had, he had to confer with his assistants and he had to trust them that no, Zidane headbutted Materazzi you know, he, he needs to be sent off and, and eventually he came to, you know, the right decision and a historic decision. And, you know, of course, all the legends that came up after that headbutt, because I think for for a couple of years, a lot of people thought that, you know, Materazzi had said something racial to yeah. Zidane or and then, it, you know, we came to find out years later that he'd actually, you know, made a comment about his sister, which was what yeah. prompted the headbutt. And and then, of course, you know, once once you get to the penalty kicks, um, this kind of brings it full circle because I had the memories 12 years prior of yep. losing the penalty kick <laughs> shootout to Brazil. I had seen Italy lose so many penalty kick shootouts over the years that you never feel good heading into that. But they ended up making all of their PKs. And, and it was, uh, you know, being with about a dozen other Italian football supporters at, at you know, a, a college friend's apartment watching that game. And and I think we maybe had one France supporter in the room who wasn't too happy about the way <laughs> things transpired. But j just the memories of, of jumping up and down and rejoicing, I thought was great. And, you know, I, I, I had grown up, of course, knowing the, the football heritage of, of Italy, you know, but I hadn't been alive for the previous World Cup victories. I, yeah. uh, it was two years from being born in 1982 when Paolo Rossi had his incredible run and helped Italy win the cup. And obviously was not around in 1934 and 1938 when they won their first two. So, you know, to, to finally see that come to fruition live unfolding on television to see them win in 2006, it was, it was really an incredible joy. And I, and I think what makes that stand out is my, my favorite game over many of the other choices I could have gone with was the mood, the atmosphere, the company that I was watching the game with, because yeah. Because I, 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 I think about a lot of like the big inter matches that I've watched over the years, and it's it's usually either me watching alone or watching with my father, and it's not a whole not a whole lot of pageantry behind it. But watching that World Cup final was just incredible. And I guess that's the the great thing, and it's actually come out in a lot of people's answers, which is when you're when you're with people, it's not really the football match itself that matters so much. It's the having that community, people supporting various different clubs, but you come together to share support in a nation, which is something that we probably quite undervalue as football fans or even as sport fans in general. It often makes for the best memories when you're sharing it with so many different people. And I think that's the magic of the World Cup because for, you know, for an Interista like myself who, who usually just... Uh, you know, uh, cowers at the sight of anything that has to do with Juventus to be <laughs> cheering for Gigi Buffon in a, yeah. in a penalty kick shootout. It's I, I think that's what the World Cup can do. It can it can bring you it can bring fans of, of rival clubs and, and people who dislike each other on a normal day. It brings people together. It's certainly a, a fantastic answer and a fantastic game to pick for your favorite one. And obviously it's one of the one of the most memorable games in modern football in history, probably not for the game itself, but because of the incident which you alluded to. <laughs> but it's certainly a, a wonderful memory. And for anyone with Italian links or Italian heritage, I can understand why they would pick that as their number one game. Yeah, it, it's a special one. And, you know, it's it, it's nice to see uh, after really a, a very rough patch for the Azzurri after, after winning that World Cup, that it, it, it finally looks like they have some direction under Mancini and they they've got some quality youth and you know the Euros will be interesting I, I don't I certainly don't expect uh, I don't expect them to win uh, the Euros but if they can make a you know a nice run quarterfinal or semifinal I think after some of the recent disappointments I think that would be pleasing to any Italian football supporter. Absolutely and I guess you're probably one of the first guests as well who's 
first football in memory and their favourite football in memory are so closely linked. Obviously, a penalty shootout in a World Cup final. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you're from a nation like the UK, like myself, we don't get to celebrate uh, World Cup finals too often. So, in fact, right. none in my lifetime whatsoever. <laughs> so, it's not something I can share, but it's a really fantastic game. And I can't thank you enough for joining us and for sharing your favourite footballing game with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. And let me say, I, I've really been enjoying the show and, and I'm glad you've you've had some people on like like Jerry Mancini and like Nima Tavale, who I who I know and I'm close to. I think you guys are doing really great things and it's great listening to all these stories. We appreciate the kind words. Thank you for your time. Anyone who wants to follow Alex and find out what he's up to, links to his Twitter and all of his, uh, his work are in the description below. So make sure you go and check it out. But a massive thanks for joining me. That was another episode of My Favourite Game.